All right, guys, welcome back to our teaching in the book of Exodus. Now, the last time we were here in chapter four, uh, disregarding that little Exodus that we did of Exodus chapter four and verse 21, to which uh, we did a very expansive exegesis on that verse, not only just simply dealing with the verse as it related to uh, God's interaction with Moses and Pharaoh, but also how it related to salvation, the principles of salvation as well, or should we say the principles of election. Now that was our last video. So if you did not see that particular video, go and check it out. It would be very eye opening as well as challenging. But anyway, so the last time we were in Exodus and our commentary, we were in chapter four and we were basically completing the commission or the call of Moses. And we were looking at the particular events or should I say the details of how God was empowering Moses to give signs. And this is very important to remember to the children of Israel so that they would believe that God had sent Moses to deliver them from the power of Pharaoh. And God gave Moses three signs to perform the staff that turns into a serpent, the hand that turned leopards and turning water from the Nile into blood. And we remember, we want to recall each of these signs pertained to Egypt in some way. And the overall point is the God of the Hebrews is greater than the so-called gods of the Egyptians. And so therefore Israel can believe that God had truly sent Moses and that God was delivering them through Moses. And so we saw that. And then at the very end, and Moses finally um, accepted the call of God And then finally, before Moses himself could be God's instrument of deliverance for the people of Israel, he himself had to be in obedience to the command of God. That is with reference to Genesis chapter 17, the command of circumcision. And so therefore God in driving this point home to Moses, he visited Moses and afflicted him almost to the point of death and where his wife had to come and circumcise Moses's son, Eleazar, to whom he had, did not circumcise at the time. And so once this happened, God then permitted Moses to go on and begin these actions of deliverance. And so with all of that, we are now into chapter five and we're going to see Moses's first encounter with Pharaoh to deliver the sons of Israel. And afterward, Moses and Aaron came and said to Pharaoh, thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, let my people go that they may celebrate a feast to me in the wilderness. But Pharaoh said, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I do not know the Lord. And besides, I would not let Israel go. Then they said, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. Please let us go three days journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. Otherwise, he will fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. But the king of Egypt said to them, Moses and Aaron, why do you draw the people away from their work? Get back to your labors. Again, Pharaoh said, look. The people of the land are now many and you would have them cease from their labors. So the same day Pharaoh commanded the task. I tell you what, let me stop there, guys, and let's deal with this first interaction. We know that God had already informed Moses that he would go. He would send him to Pharaoh to give the give Pharaoh the command to let the children of Israel go for a three days journey to worship God in the wilderness and that Pharaoh would be unwilling to let them go. And so now this is that time when Moses, his first appearance to Pharaoh and that Pharaoh refused to let them go. And the point was that if Pharaoh would not be willing to do a small thing, that is go three days journey to the wilderness to let them go, he would not be willing to do a great thing. Let the people go all together. Okay. So this is proof positive here. And notice in this first uh, interaction that we have with Moses and Pharaoh 
It is not God who is hardening Pharaoh's heart at this time. Pharaoh's heart is already hardened. So you need to go back and check out once again, the video that I did in Exodus four and 21, when God says he'll harden Pharaoh's heart. He hardens Pharaoh's heart because Pharaoh's heart has already been hard. And so therefore God will later come and sanction it. This is what we call once again, judicial hardening, judicial hardening. When a person here, we have Pharaoh or a nation, it could be either one. When they have already set in their mind a particular course, God is righteous and just to harden them that they would take no other course. Okay. But anyway, once again, check that video out, but let's go back to the commentary. So they go verse number one and they say, thus say the Lord. And here is again, once again, that formula that prophets from latter from, from following times will use when they speak a word that is literally from the mouth of the Lord. Okay. Thus saith the Lord, and notice they say the God of Israel. Now, I don't want to get into a lot of talk about this, but here is basically identification. Remember, Egypt has a pantheon of gods, many gods. And so therefore, this God that Moses is speaking of is unknown to Pharaoh. And remember also, too, that Pharaoh is considered to be a God himself. And so it would, it would seem like uh, 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 to be depreciating the person of Pharaoh for him to take a command and obey a command from a God that he does not even know. And so what Moses literally said is, thus said Yahweh, Yahweh. And who is Yahweh? The God of Israel. And that is why Pharaoh responds and says, I don't know of Yahweh. Never heard of him. And so therefore tell me, why should I obey this Yahweh, a God whom I've never heard of before? And the answer is no, I will not let Israel go. So he goes and gives him the first offer. First part of it. Let him serve God. Let us go into the wilderness. And he emphasizes in verse number three that this will not be a long period, a three days journey into the wilderness that he will serve God or else if Israel, and here's what you have to see. Now the threat here is not against Egypt at this time. The threat is because it's against Israel's disobedience to worship God in the wilderness. And that's why he says, else he will fall upon us with pestilence or the sword that God will fall upon the Israelites if they refuse to worship God. And so he's saying, let us go because if we don't go, our God will send judgment upon us. Pharaoh shows no concern for the Israelite people at all because to them, to, I'm sorry, to Pharaoh, the Israelites are simply a source of labor at this time. He cares nothing for them, nothing for their welfare. And then again, he does not believe or accept their God. Now here's the thing too, that is beautiful. And I want to make an aside very quickly. Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice? That sets the very foundation and tenor for all of the plagues that will come upon Egypt. In all that God will do to Egypt from the very first plague that he strikes until the final plague that drives Israel out of Egypt. All of these things are done so that the Egyptians will know. And we'll see that even later on in chapter six, but so that the Egyptians will know that the Lord, in other words, Yahweh is God. So Pharaoh asked the question at the very beginning of this meeting. And he will get an answer through the strong power that God will reveal to the Egyptians. Okay. Who is the Lord? All right. So anyway, he accuses Moses of drawing the people, making them rest from their labors. And the word here is burdens. And that's exactly what they were had under Egyptians, hard 
burdens, labors and burdens. He, so he accused Moses. You're drawing the people away from their labors. And he said, I tell you what you do. Get back to your work. All right. So now let's continue in verse number five. Again, Pharaoh said, look, the people of the land are now many and you would have them cease from their labors. So the same day, Pharaoh commanded the taskmasters over the people and their foremen saying, you are no longer to give the people straw to make brick as previously. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. But the quota of bricks, which they were making previously, you shall impose on them. You are not to reduce any of it because they are lazy. Therefore, they cry out, let us go and sacrifice to our God. Let the labor be heavier on the men and let them work at it so that they will pay no attention to false words. So the response of the Pharaoh to his servants was, he says, behold, he said, look at the people. He said, they are very many. And now they have time not to go to work. And so he's looking at this, so many people and still they find time not to work. I tell you what you do, no longer give them straw for their daily tally of bricks. Now, the straw was not an agent so much as to make bricks, but it was basically used, put into the bricks, into the sand and the mortar to make the bricks stronger. And this is what the Egyptians would gather for the Hebrew slaves. And the slaves would take the straw that the Hebrew, uh, Hebrew people gathered and make the bricks. And so he gives the command for the slaves to go and find the straw for themselves. You find straw wherever you want. So now don't remember now, they're already under the harshness of the bondage of the Egyptians, harsh labor every day. And so now he compiles that uh, harsh labor by telling them, go gather your own straw. We won't give you any more straw. So now they got to gather the straw and make the bricks. And the Pharaoh says, but your daily number of bricks that you are required to make are, should not be diminished. So he tells his officers and taskmasters, and this is not so important to see, but it's kind of good to see that the officers here and the taskmasters are Egyptian. So he tells, he commands his Egyptian because there are actually three groups of people over the uh, Hebrew slaves the officers and taskmasters who are Egyptians. And then from these, these officers and taskmasters, they will appoint uh, Israelite Hebrew taskmasters over their own people. Okay. But nevertheless, so he was basically saying, you go gather your own straw and this will make them even more busier than usual so that they won't give heed to these, what he calls false words. In other words, what the Pharaoh is trying to do is crush the Israelites people's hope of any deliverance whatsoever. So it is even firmer on them. Okay. So he sends his own people out to tell the Hebrew people that this is now the new requirement. Get straw for yourselves. Now let's continue. Verse number 10. So the taskmasters of the people and their foremen went out and spoke to the people saying, thus says Pharaoh, I am not going to give you any straw. You go and get straw for yourselves wherever you can find it, but none of your labor will be reduced. So the people scattered throughout all the land of Egypt to gather stubble for straw. The taskmasters pressed them saying, complete your work quota your daily amount, just as when you had straw. Moreover, the foremen of the sons of Israel, whom Pharaoh's taskmasters had set over them, were beaten and were asked, why have you not completed your required amount either yesterday or today in making bricks as previously? So let me stop there. So now the foremen and the taskmasters, the Egyptians, go out to the Hebrew slaves and they inform the Hebrew taskmasters as well as the Hebrews. So that's how it goes to the order of things. 
And this information goes to all of the Hebrew slaves that no straw will be gathered for them and that their daily quota is still, they still need to produce that and they are to gather straw wherever they can find it. And so the people go about gathering the straw in order to make bricks and as they are gathered. So of course this takes time to do, and you already got a number of bricks that you have to make each day. And here's the idea that they're barely making anyway. They're barely making the quota. And now when they got to gather the straw to make the bricks, of course they won't have time. But see, that was in the mind of the Pharaoh in the first place to kill any hope of deliverance. But so of course they failed to produce the number of bricks for that day and even the following day. And when they failed to meet the tally of bricks, the taskmasters, that is the Hebrew taskmasters, not the, the, the Egyptian officers and taskmasters, the Hebrew taskmasters are taken and beaten. And, and you can imagine, now think now, think now, you can imagine the kind of beating that they would give these Hebrew slaves. Okay. And so when they beat the Hebrew slave taskmasters, they, they began to respond that the Egyptians were acting unjustly towards them. They said, why are you beating us? You've made us go and get the straw. We don't have time. You're not treating us fairly. We just can't do this. And so they respond to them. No, you're lazy. You're lazy. You need to make the same amount of bricks. You're lazy. And this has simply come from the words of the Pharaoh and that you want to go and worship your God. But yet you can't make these bricks. You are lazy. You are lazy. And that's the accusation that the Egyptian officers and taskmasters are given the Hebrew taskmasters as they are being beaten. Okay, let's continue. Then the foreman of the sons of Israel came and cried out to Pharaoh saying, why do you deal this way with your servants? There is no straw given to your servants. Yet they keep saying to us, make bricks and behold, your servants are being beaten but it is the fault of your own people. But he said, you are lazy, very lazy. Therefore you say, let us go and sacrifice to the Lord. So go now and work for you will be given no straw yet. You must deliver the quota of bricks. The foreman of the sons of Israel saw that they were in trouble because they were told you must not reduce your daily amount of bricks. Let's stop there. So now the same Hebrew slave foreman, taskmasters appeal to Pharaoh and they say unto Pharaoh that, you know, your servants are being beaten because we cannot produce the same number of bricks as before. He said, but the fault is not with your servants, not with us Hebrew slaves. The fault is with your own people. Now I kind of wanted to laugh there because these Hebrew slaves know that the command came from Pharaoh himself, but they weren't going to tell Pharaoh that the fault was his because <laughs> You would make your own situation even worse. Don't blame the Pharaoh for it. Of course, say the, the fault is your own people. There is these Egyptian taskmasters. It ain't, it's not yours, Pharaoh. But anyway, and so they're going to Pharaoh to, for an appeal, saying to Pharaoh to change your mind or, or change this situation. But what was the end result? There was no change in Pharaoh at all. In other words, he still maintained his edict that they had to go and get their own straw as well as produce the number of bricks. And Pharaoh accused them of simply saying, you are lazy, so very lazy because, and this is why you come to me with all of this idle time saying, let us now go to our God Yahweh and worship. No, you may not go to Yahweh and worship, but you will produce my same number of bricks and you will get the straw for yourselves. So they left from the presence of Pharaoh, understanding that their present situation now 
is much worse than it was before. And this is what you have to see in this whole event. They have the hope of deliverance that Moses had given them. Remember, Moses went to them and performed the signs. The people believed the signs that Moses had given and worshiped God, believing that the day of their deliverance was at hand. And instead of deliverance, now the harshness of their bondage was made even worse than before. So when they went to Pharaoh uh, this time saying, Pharaoh, please lighten this load in some kind of way. And they probably were hoping that he would begin to give them straw again or even reduce the tally of number of bricks. He did neither. And so they left realizing that their case is worse than ever before. Okay. Now let's, let's bring this to an end. When they left Pharaoh's presence, verse number 20, they met Moses and Aaron as they were waiting for them. They said to them, May the Lord look upon you and judge you, for you have made us odious in Pharaoh's sight and in the sight of his servants to put a sword in their hand to kill us. Then Moses returned to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, why have you brought harm to this people? Why did you ever send me? Ever since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done harm to this people and you have not delivered your people at all. Now, it gets kind of harsh, but let's look at it. So for some reason, Moses was not present with the Hebrew taskmasters when they went before Moses. I would assume that's dangerous to do, but I would assume they were probably thinking, Moses, you've made it bad on us in the first place. Let us just go handle this thing. But nevertheless, Moses was waiting for them. And when they got back to Moses, they began to hurl accusations at Moses to simply say, you have made us to stink in the sight of in the nostrils before Pharaoh and his people. You've made things worse for before be, between us and the Egyptians, Moses, than it has ever been. And because of the situation now, that is, the people now have to go and gather their own straw to make the same number of bricks to, to the which they are not able to do. And the people and the taskmasters are beaten. And because of the labor, the, the, this untold hardship of labor that is being placed upon the Hebrew slaves, it will result in the deaths of many slaves. And this is what they mean when they say you have put a sword in the hands of the Egyptians to kill us. It means that because of the oppressive labor that is now being placed upon the Hebrew slaves, many of them will die. And so they hurl this accusation at Moses and they tell, and they say to Moses, may the Lord judge you because you have done this. And that's what they mean when they say, the Lord look upon you and judge. So they're asking for God to judge Moses. How quickly the people change from when they were in chapter four, at the very end of it, they were worshiping God in hope. And all it took was one something to go wrong for the people to change their attitude and behavior. And this, is what we will see. This is just the very beginning. This becomes a foundation and a principle for the behavior of what we will see with this generation, even once God begins to deliver them and after he delivers them in their testing in the wilderness, this is what Moses is going to talk about in the book of Deuteronomy, how God allowed them to suffer hunger and thirst so that he might test them, put them to the test. We will see in this generation, a generation of faithlessness. So what am I trying to say in all of this? This points to a foundational truth concerning this generation and their faithlessness. When God begins to test them, they will consistently fail the test. And ultimately what will happen? 
God will replace this generation and allow their children, the next generation, to inherit the promise of entering into the land of Canaan, the promised land. But okay, enough said about that. So what happens as they come to Moses with such an accusation that this is all your fault, Moses, Moses immediately. And this doesn't make, make Moses look good at all either. I hate to say it, but it doesn't. So he goes to God immediately and says to him, master, he begins to question not only his commission, but he begins to question God simply saying, from the very moment that you sent me, nothing good has happened. Why did you send me in the first place? Why? Because since I came first to speak to Pharaoh in your name, only evil has come upon this people. And then Moses says to God, and it makes me cringe a little bit right here. And you have not delivered your people at all. It makes me cringe like, wait a minute now. This is God. He said he would deliver and be careful in accusing God. Now, Moses is not so much accusing God, but he is in a sense, no doubt, questioning God, sending him again. So he goes all the way back. Remember again, chapter three, questioning why God is sending him. So he, again, he begins to question his commission. But the point here is that I'm pushing here. All right. God is going to deliver. Wait a minute, Moses, be careful. He will deliver. But nevertheless, God demonstrates patience. As we move into chapter six, God will demonstrate his patience, both with Moses as well as his people, as God affirms the fact, indeed, I will deliver. And this was just the starting point. So join me for chapter six. And chapter six will basically become an interlude before the showdown begins. As God begins to confirm to Moses that don't worry, it may not seem like the first time was a success. It's just getting started. Indeed, I will deliver Israel. And when I get through with Pharaoh and the Egyptians, he won't just let you go. He will drive you out. All right, guys, thanks for joining me. Join me again for chapter six as we get into the exciting interlude for the showdown that's about to begin.